listen for God's word as it comes to us from the book of Acts, the first history book of the church, the 17th chapter beginning to read at the 16th verse. Listen now for God's holy word. While Paul waited for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to find that the city was flooded with idols. He began to interact with the Jew and Gentile God worshipers in the synagogues. He also addressed whoever happened to be in the marketplace each day. Certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers engaged him in discussion too. Some said, what an amateur. What's he trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. They said this because he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him into custody and brought him to the council on Mars Hill. What is this new teaching? Can we learn what you're talking about? You've told us some strange things and we want to know what they mean. They said this because all Athenians, as well as the foreigners who live in Athens, used to spend their time doing nothing but talking about or listening to the newest thing. Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What you worship as an unknown, I now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made with human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed something since he is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else. From one person, God created every human nation to live on this whole earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their land. God made the nations so they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In God we live, move, and exist. As some of your own poets said, we are his offspring. Therefore, as God's offspring, we have no need to imagine that the divine being is like a gold, silver, or stone image made by human skill and thought. God overlooks ignorance of these things in times past, but now directs everyone everywhere to change their hearts and lives. This is because God has set a day when he intends to judge the world justly by a man he has appointed. God has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. God's holy word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the thoughts of our minds, the meditations of our hearts be worthy in your sight. By the power of the Holy Spirit, open us to hear something fresh this morning. In Christ's name, amen. In the mid-1800s, a world-renowned violinist was on tour in the city of New York. He was there for a number of weeks, and he had a good friend who lived in New York City, and on the weekends, he would spend his nights with his friend. On one weekend, his friend invited him to go to church with him. An old bull said, if I agree to go to church with you, it will be under one condition, that you take me to hear someone who tempts me with the impossible. Well, that is what the church has been expected to deliver for the world since the days of Jesus Christ. The world looks to the church to tempt it with the impossible. For we want to know that there's a power available to us that is beyond our power, a capacity that is beyond our own capacity, the ability to do something that we cannot do by ourselves, but because we have a power that is greater than our power, we can do what other people would say is the impossible. The world looks to the church to tempt us to do the impossible. And so often the world is disappointed, and so are we. Much discussion has been coming out in the media 
recently about why the churches throughout this nation and around Europe are declining in membership and attendance and financial support. One of the primary reasons, I believe, is that the world has looked to the church to tempt it with the impossible, and we have failed to do so. And there is discouragement and disappointment that the church is not tempting us to do the impossible in the power of the risen Christ. Some three months ago or so, I was invited by the Presbytery of Tropical Florida, of which we are a part, to visit with a church on a Sunday afternoon who was feeling considerable discouragement. They've taken their membership down to 11. 11 people remain in this congregation, and they are broken. And I sat with them and listened to their stories. And one woman among the 11 asked this question, why is our church, not just our church, she said, but the churches across this nation, why is our church playing defensive? When are we going to start winning again? That is a question that many people are asking. When is the church of Jesus Christ going to start winning again? It seems we are playing defense when we should be playing offense. The Apostle Paul went to the city of Athens, and he went there to proclaim the power of the risen Christ. But Paul was a wise communicator because all wise communicators consider their audience before they stand to speak. Even preachers, Greg and I, whenever we have to stand before you and preach a sermon, we consider very carefully how do we start. How you start is everything. Any communicator knows that how you start must be appropriate to your audience. The Apostle Paul has gone to Athens, and he wants to proclaim the power of the risen Christ, but he is wondering, how do I start in this city? So he tells us in the passage of Scripture we just heard that he began to walk throughout their town. And as he did, he looked carefully and noticed multiple, multiple objects of worship, altars, and sculptures to this God and that God and the other God. And he eavesdropped on the conversations that were taking place in the city and discovered that everyone was hungry to discover some new thing that might give them power for extraordinary living. They were listening to every new voice and every new thing, hoping they would find the one voice and the one thing that would give them a temptation to live for the impossible. How to start? asked the Apostle Paul. How do I start proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ in this place? And as he's looking around and he sees this altar and this sculpture to this God and to that God, he notices that there's an altar with the inscription on it to the unknown God. You see, the people of Athens wanted to be sure that they didn't miss a God lest they incur the wrath of that God. So they got an altar and a sculpture to every imaginable God. And just to be sure, we have an altar to the God that we do not yet know. So no God could be angry. And then it comes to the Apostle Paul how he is to preach his sermon in Athens. And in good Presbyterian form, he preaches a three-point sermon. All three points are right there. If you want to go home and look at this passage again, the three points that I share with you this morning are right here in the most compelling sermon that the Apostle Paul ever preached. And he begins this way. I see that you are a religious people, that you are a people with spiritual hungers, I see it in the altars and the sculptures all around the city. I've heard you speak on the streets how you're listening for every new thing, looking for hope, looking for power. I see that you are people with a spiritual appetite. And so great is that appetite, you even have an altar right there to the unknown God. 
And I'm here today to declare that I know the name of that God. And that God wants to be known by you as well. That God has been revealed in the person of Jesus, who is the Christ, meaning this God revealed in Jesus is the God above all gods and is the power above all powers. In fact, none of these other gods matter. Only one God matters. It is the God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, you will be tempted to the impossible. I've been a pastor for 36 years, and early in my ministry, very early in my ministry, I learned that the prominent theologian John Leith would be speaking on the campus of my alma mater, Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. I had read John Leith's work when I was doing my graduate studies preparing for the ministry. I admire his book on Christian doctrine above most books on Christian doctrine available today. John Leith has an extraordinary mind and the capacity to write about the parameters of a reformed faith, but to write in a manner that most people can understand. But most powerfully of all of John Leith's gifts was his ability to look at the horizon to see what's coming before anybody else could see it. I speak in the past tense. The world lost John Leith some years ago. I wanted to hear John Leith, so I made plans to go back to my alma mater, to go back to the campus of Eckerd College to hear John. Other pastors showed up as well. And the words he spoke that day, the most important word he spoke was this. Pastors, watch. Watch the horizon. A crisis is coming to the church throughout this country. Now, this is over 30 years ago I heard him speak. And he said, watch, there's a crisis coming to the church, and we're going to see membership drop. We're going to see attendance and worship drop. We're going to see financial support of the church drop. Watch it. In 20 or 25 years or 30 years, there's a crisis coming. And he said, the reason for that crisis is amnesia. People are forgetting who God is. Now, John Leith said that if you say that to your congregation today, they'll say you're out of your mind, Pastor. We know who God is. It is Jesus. But friends, to know the name of God doesn't mean that you know God. We have in season... A couple that worships with us, you may be here now, from Ohio. They're wise enough to escape winters in Ohio and be here. But their pastor in Ohio is a good friend of mine, James Hodgson. Uh, James Hodgson will freely tell you that he was going into business management, but was a member of the congregation I served some years ago in Texas and because of my ministry, felt a call to ministry and is a pastor now. The couple that comes to our church in season went back and told James about Greg Rapier, our associate pastor, and what an outstanding pastor he is. James calls me and said, I understand you've got an exceptional associate pastor. I do. What is his name? It's Greg Rapier. Would you tell me something about him? That second question is very important. <laughs> the second question means that just because my friend knows the name now of Greg Rapier doesn't mean that he knows Greg Rapier. Would you tell me something about him? Just because you know the name of Jesus doesn't mean that you know Jesus very well. John Leith is absolutely right. People are forgetting God. We are here in worship because we have put our names on Jesus as our Lord. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we've been paying attention to Jesus. 
and we may be forgetting who God is. And when we forget God, we are no longer tempted to the impossible. Paul stands before the Athenians and says, I know the name of that unknown God. God has revealed God's self in the person of Jesus. And the first point I want you to hear, says Paul, is that God no longer wants to be in the shadows. God no longer wants to be without a name. God no longer wants to be a mystery to you. God wants to be known by you. God loves you. And God's name is Jesus. And then in good customary Presbyterian form, Paul goes to his second point. It's right here in the text. Not only does God want you to know God's name, God wants you to be God's children and wants you to claim the birthright that is yours as the children of Almighty God. My son Nathaniel is 34 years old. 34 years ago when he was born, I was in the room when he was born, and Dr. Nobo, after he received the birth of Nathaniel, wrapped Nathaniel in a cloth and placed Nathaniel into my arms for the first time. And he said, here's your son, Dad. Are you aware that before that moment, I was never called Dad? Here's your son, Dad. And a flash of insight occurred to me. I am now a father, a dad, with responsibility responsibility for the life of this young child and I was overwhelmed by it and so at the end of the day that he was born I sat down and wrote him a letter I said son I want you to know how proud I am to be your father and I want you to know that I'm going to do all I can to be right by you and to take care of you and to love you but I also want you to know that I am going to fail you many times because I am a human. So let me end this letter, son, by telling you that there's another father that will never fail you. And that father is known in the person of Jesus Christ. I sealed that letter in an envelope and placed it into a secure place in my home. Nearly two years later, my daughter Rachel was born, and I wrote the same letter to Rachel, sealed the letter on the day of her birth, and placed it into a secure place in my home. When my son started college 18 years later, after my wife and I got him moved into his dormitory room, hugged him, told him how proud we were, I secretly placed the letter on his desk and left. He found it at the end of the day. The same for Rachel. And they read a letter written to them by their father, written 18 years earlier. Well, God has written that letter to each of us in the birth of Jesus Christ. God communicated to us through the prophets of the Old Testament. But God came to us personally in the person of Jesus Christ to say that we are the children of Almighty God. And in Christ, God lived among us for 33 years and taught us and told us what it means to be the heirs of the kingdom of heaven. We need only to read the letter, to read the teachings of Jesus Christ, and to read the teachings of the Apostle Paul who teaches us deeper understanding about Jesus Christ. To understand that we are children of Almighty God. And then the third point and the concluding point that the Apostle Paul makes in this great, astounding, and compelling sermon to the Athenians 
is that our God desires to transform our lives. God wants to work in us in such a way that we are able to do what the world says is impossible. God wants to pour power into us so that people will look at us and say, there's no way that Steve or Adam or Teresa can do that by their own strength. There must be another power. It is the power of God working in the individuals. Every one of us are promised that power if we allow God to do that. But God needs our permission to transform our lives. Some years ago, a great stone cathedral in Europe was known among all the great Europe cathedrals as having the most magnificent organ. The pipe organ in that cathedral was better than any other organ in any other cathedral throughout Europe. One day, the sexton of this great cathedral, this great organ, was locking up the church. It was a Saturday. And as he was locking the church up, he heard steps across the stone floor. And he thought to himself, I thought I'd locked the front door. Apparently he had not. There was a traveler wearing somewhat tattered traveling clothes walking across the floor of this empty stone cathedral up to the chancel area, up toward the organ. The sexton asked, excuse me, we are locking up. The traveler said, I apologize, but I have traveled a long ways and at some expense to see the magnificent organ of this church. I've heard so much about it. May I see it? The sexton said, you can see it tomorrow. Tomorrow is Sunday. You can not only see it, you can hear it played. Come back tomorrow. The traveler said, I've come so far. May I just look at it now? The sexton was reluctant at first, but he allowed the stranger, this traveler, to come up to the organ and look at it. And then the stranger asked, may I sit at the organ? No said the sexton. We have an organist who's very particular about the instrument. The stranger just continued to stand there with disappointment heavy in his eyes. And the sexton said, okay, just for a moment, but don't touch anything. <laughs> the stranger sat at the organ and looked at the console and said, may I just play a few keys? That is absolutely out of the question. That is a sensitive, expensive instrument but again, the disappointment and the sadness in the stranger's eyes overcame the sexton. And he said, just a couple of notes, and then I'm going to ask you to leave. And the stranger began to play. The stranger began to play the organ, and the sexton realized, I have never heard this organ so beautifully played. The cathedral was filled with outstanding, beautiful, moving music. And then when the stranger completed the piece he played, he got up respectfully, thanked the sexton for the opportunity, and began to wake, make his way out the door. Just before the stranger left, the sexton said, Sir, I apologize, but I didn't catch your name. What is your name? It's Mendelssohn, Felix Mendelssohn. The Stexon wrote later, just think, I nearly kept the master from playing his music in my cathedral. It is a parable for us, isn't it? Jesus Christ is the master who wants to play Jesus' music in each of our lives. But so often we keep Jesus at arm's length because well, we've accomplished much in life, and we like our life just fine. And we don't want the master to interfere with us because, well, our lives may go in a direction that we don't intend. So, Jesus, thank you for your death and your resurrection, but if you can just stay at arm's length, my life is just fine. Or 
our lives have been such a disaster that we will take help from any source we can. But we don't understand that Jesus Christ can only transform our lives. When we give ourselves increasingly over to Jesus Christ, how do you do that? By reading the scriptures every day, paying attention to what Jesus Christ teaches, and then obeying to the best of your ability. You need not be concerned, says Soen Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher, about what you don't understand. Concern yourself with what you do understand, but do not obey. Pay attention to Jesus. Obey Jesus as best as you understand. Say, Jesus, enter my life, take over my life, transform my life, play your music in me so that I may feel a power I have never felt before, that I may be tempted to do the impossible. The Apostle Paul preaches to the church in Athens and preaches to us this morning. We have a God who wants to be known and has revealed God's self to us in the person of Jesus Christ. We have a God who wants to call us children of Almighty God with a birthright to go with it. And finally, we have a God who wants to enter our lives and to transform us and to give us a power we never thought we had. And individual by individual by individual and church after church after church, as people begin to open their lives to the transformative power of God, their churches will begin to have power. And then the world will see something happening that they have not seen in a long time. The church is now tempting the word world to do the impossible. And we'll see pews fill up once again. Amen.